God bless you, everyone. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Melly Martinez. Check us out at resurrectionspringfield.org and like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at TRC413 and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Res Send Spring and hear us on radio at resurrectioncenterradio.com. You've seen the posters and the announcements of our first fruit celebration, and that day is coming. It's coming up soon. This year, we celebrate on Sunday, October 25th in the year 2020, so let's get ready. This year's first fruit celebration has been moved to our earlier uh, date in the spring to now it's going to be October 25th due to the pandemic that interrupted the original plans that had been put in place. I believe it was in April of 2020. This year's celebration will more closely match the Jewish New Year Rosh Hashanah, I can't even say it, Rosh Hashanah 2020 that began on the evening of Friday, September 18th. The Jewish New Year is the first of the Jewish High Holy Days specified by Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23 uh, through 32, that occur in the early autumn of the Northern Hemisphere. The current Jewish year is AM 5780, 5780. The AM stands for Anu Mundi, that's Latin, in the year of the world the abbreviation AM, the year dating from the year of creation in Jewish chronology based on rabbinic calculations. We will celebrate on Sunday, March 25th at noon. Rosh Hashanah 2020 began in the evening of Friday, September 18th, and ended in the evening of Sunday, September 20. Rosh Hashanah is the celebration of the Jewish New Year, on Rosh Hashanah, Jews from all over the world celebrate God's creation of the world. Rosh Hashanah marks the start of the Jewish High Holy Days leading up to Yom Kippur. It marks the beginning of the 10 Days of Awe, as it's referred to, in which Jewish people focus on the attentions on repentance and reflection leading up to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, considered to be the holiest day of the Jewish year. So Yom Kippur 2020 began in the evening of Sunday, September 27th, and ended in the evening of Monday, September 28th. It is on Yom Kippur the Jewish are encouraged to make amends and ask forgiveness for sins committed during the past year. The holiday is observed with a 25-hour fast and a special religious service. This is why October 25th, makes sense to celebrate our first fruit offering this year. The only way you can be ready uh, for the first fruits is if you know what first fruits is. If I don't tell you about tithes and offerings first, then first fruits won't make sense. So that's what I'm going to do. We'll talk about tithes and offerings first. Next, we'll talk about first fruits. Finally, you'll be an expert in all three. Today, we discussed the theology of first fruits, that is, the academic understanding of first fruits. Next week, we'll talk about the divinity of first fruits, that's the spiritual understanding of first fruits. So, here's a story I'm going to share with you uh, that'll better illustrate uh, the idea of tithes and offerings and first fruits. So, here's a story of when I was a small boy with one of my brothers. Some of you know I'm from a large family, so this is my younger brother. He's two years younger than me. So my brother and I are in a sandbox at our house with our toy dump trucks. He had blue and I had red. Both were the same other than uh, the color. We could exchange, but he kept blue and I kept red. Mine is mine and his is his. Who owned the trucks? Where did they come from? Well, see, that didn't matter to us. See, it was a Christmas gift given out of love from our parents. On Christmas Day, my mother was sitting next to me and I said, where's my truck? She said, it is, here it is, and she put her, her hand on it. So you see, when that happened, I don't know why I said it. I kind of marveled to myself, why did I say that? I didn't even know I was getting a truck for Christmas. It, it was just assumed. For me, the truck was mine, but yet there it was. It didn't matter who or where it came from. We convert love into assumed ownership. See, my parents gave me love by giving me this toy. 
But when I asked for it and I received it, I just assumed it was mine. I didn't even know that it was coming. I had a selfish conditioning of the mind. It is developed, this selfish conditioning of the mind is developed when we are young. It's natural as it's part of our self-defense defense survival mechanism. The root source of this mechanism is good as humankind must survive. Yet it's bad because it steers us away from God. So we must evolve and grow up very quickly. See, God gives us love by blessings, and we assume we own it through our own selfish desires. Here's an illustration. Here's another illustration. I do two things at Harvard University. First, my team and I are creating a state holiday working with the governor's office for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's something we're doing with Harvard University. That's a testimony for next year, but it's happening now. Second, I'm taking a course of study in theology for divinity at Harvard University. I graduate in early December. That's, that's a fun secret. I haven't told anyone. Here's the deal. The old me would say, I worked hard and paid for it, and my hard work positioned me to work with the governor's office in Harvard University. The old me would have been very prideful. Here's the new me. And thank God there's a new me. <laughs> the new me recognizes that God gave me an opportunity. Say opportunity. God gave me an opportunity for an even greater blessings in the future. I owe God gratitude for the opportunity. So you reap what you sow. And so I'm sowing now for an opportunity that I will reap in the future. God gave me this opportunity. So I owe God gratitude. How do I pay for this gratitude? It's done through character and integrity. Say to yourself, character and integrity. The Bible teaches us biblical principles specific to character and integrity. Again, character and integrity. Character equals the offering. That's related to the behavior towards giving. Integrity relates to the tithing, obedience to instruction, okay? More will be explained soon. Tithes and offerings are different. They're not the same. There is an order that we'll talk about later. For example, number one, tithes is number one. It's given first. Number two, offerings is number two. It's given after, after tithes. Tithes becomes, comes before offering. Offering comes after tithes. There's an order. It's a biblical principle. Let's start simple. Let's begin with tithes. A tithe in the Bible tells us about a specific measurable amount. It's 10% of your income. So if it's $100, 10% is $10. Just move the decimal point over. So a tithe is a specific amount. It's 10% of your income that you give first. And an offering is anything extra that you give beyond the 10%. So let's talk about a scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. This is a biblical principle that is different from an offering. Tithing is the first 10%, and an offering is what is after and beyond the 10%. It's not the same. An offering alone is not a biblical principle because an offering is what comes after tithes. And an offering that comes after tithes, that is a biblical principle. An offering alone, that is not a biblical principle. Without the tithe, there is no offering. Imagine a broken down car with a tow truck. The car is dead without the tow truck. An offering in terms of a biblical principle is dead without the tithe. Same thing. An offering alone is ignorance. It's that simple. It's ignorance to the principle. So payment of a tithe, let's go back to tithes. And payment of a tithe is an obligation. Say to yourself, obligation. We read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, where Christians are required to give 10% of their income to God through the church if faithfully adhere to the act to attract rich blessings from the Lord. This is also confirmed in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Again, that's in Leviticus chapter 27, 
verse 30 through 34. A lesson on tithes can be found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, 30 through 34. See, now you have a guide. We'll talk about Malachi later. Tithing is a form of obedience because it shows God you trust him, not money to provide. You don't seek money for your favor and provision. You seek God for your favor and provision. Again, tithing is an act of obedience. Worship, on the other hand, is a ministry. Worship, on the other hand, is a ministry to the Lord. You cannot minister to the Lord with your money. He doesn't need it. He needs your obedience. That's what God needs. Tithing ensures that our needs will be met and gives back to God what was always his. God is honored when we are faithful. Let's talk about disobedience. Why not? It's what people do. No surprise there. If you don't pay tithe, the Bible says you are robbing God and you are under a curse. I'm going to show that to you. Say curse. This curse cannot be removed by your good works or the fact that you are born again. That can't happen. You can only reverse the curse if you start paying tithes. Tithes is the only key to prosperity and God's blessing. The book of Malachi teaches us that. Now I'm going to read the book of Malachi, uh, which is chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Uh, and the scripture reads, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me on this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, I talk to you about Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Leviticus chapter 27, 30 through 34. So I will read that now. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belong to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute becomes holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commands to the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai for the Israelites. So what this is referring to is when you tithe, you don't pay all your bills first and then figure out what the 10% is. You've got your net, not, not, not before taxes, but your after taxes income. Whatever that is, you tithe off of that. Then cover your other expenses because God provides. Now let me talk about offerings. I'm going to switch over to offerings now. In offerings, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, the scripture uh, reads, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, tithing, on the other hand, is the first 10%, and an offering is what is after and beyond the 10%. They're not the same. Remember in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, that refers to tithes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, that refers to offerings. And remember, we learned that tithes is explained more in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Now I'm going to turn our attention to character and integrity. A tithe is a specific amount, it's 10% of your income, that you give first. An offering is anything extra that you give beyond that. Character comes from your offering, it's what is in your heart. Integrity comes from your tithing. You are entrusted with the principles to follow. It's what determines your trustworthiness and your obedience. So here's a review of tithing and, uh, and offering. Character relates to your offering. Integrity relates to your tithing. 
An offering reflects your character. Obedience uh, to tithing shows your true integrity. Character is learned about in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. That's the offering. Integrity is learned about in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. That's tithe. Become a tithing expert by looking at Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Now, just for the folks uh, here in the United States, charitable donations are tax deductible, and the IRS considers church tithing tax deductible as well. To deduct the amount you tithe to your church or place of worship, report the amount you donate to qualified charitable organizations, such as churches on Schedule A. What is Schedule A? That's the itemized deductions. Where do you get the recorded information? Well, here at the Resurrection Center, uh, when you uh, donate by cash, we save all the envelopes, okay? So when you put cash in the, and you write the information on the envelope, use your cell phone, take a picture of the envelope. Um, if you write a check, well, the check, you can get that through your online banking. That's your receipt. If it's done by card, we text uh, the receipt to you. So all of your receipts you have. Okay, we know about tithing and offering. We can now talk about first fruits. We are ready now. Okay, so what is first fruits in the Bible? So here's how the story goes. Let's talk about this. The book of Exodus, the book of Exodus narrates how Moses led the Israelites in the building of the tabernacle. That's in Exodus chapter 35 verse, uh, Exodus, I should say, 35 through 40, with God's instructions. And that's in Exodus 25 through 31. Okay. So then in the book of Leviticus, God tells the Israelites and the priests how to make offerings in the tabernacle and how to conduct themselves while camped around the holy tent sanctuary. Okay, the book of Exodus talks about the people. The book of Leviticus talks about the instructions. So that's why Exodus and Leviticus are both important because they have two pieces of information. The book of Leviticus is the third book of the Old Testament. It's also the third book of the Torah. It contains a record of God's installing a priesthood for his nation and giving them biblical principles that would enable them to maintain holiness in his eyes. Now, before I read a scripture in Leviticus, let me tell you what a sheaf is, a sheaf. The definition of a sheaf. That's a bundle of grain stalks laid lengthwise and tied together after harvesting, after reaping, okay? So now I'm going to read Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And that's in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. Did you hear me say first fruits? Okay. The concepts of first fruit is rooted in biblical times when people lived in an agricultural society. Harvest time was significant because that is when the hard work the farmers had poured into the crops all year began to pay off. They were literally reaping what they sowed. And that's why we get the phrase, you reap what you sow. God called his people to bring the first yield, the first early portion of the harvest, the first fruits, that key word first. This was to demonstrate to the Israelites the obedience, trust, and reverence for God. Back then, there were plenty of rules associated with making first fruit sacrifices. They had to be brought to the temple priests. No other crops could be harvested until after the first fruits were presented. I'm going to say that again because it's kind of like tithes in the first portion. No other crops could be harvested until after the first fruits were presented. It was a complex process. That is why it became ceremonial. So you see, first fruits is a ceremony. And here at the resurrection, it's going to be at noon on Sunday, March 25th. I should say October 25th. I said March 25th, it's October 25th. Um, the Hebrew word for the first fruit is bikram, literally translated to promise to come. 
the Israelites saw these first fruits as an investment into their future. God told them that if they brought their first fruits to him, he would bless all that came afterward. First fruits is a prophetic offering. We talked about how tithes relates to integrity, that's trust and obedience, and offering relates to character, and that's behavior. Now you know first fruits is prophetic offering. That's how the three are different. Now let's talk about the first fruits in the Bible. Now I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. We see the term first fruits initially mentioned in the book of Exodus when Moses is leading God's people out of captivity in Egypt. God instructed the Israelites to give up the first of their crops so that they would, or they could, I should say, understand the value of God's blessings. Through the first five books of the Bible, Moses brings up the idea uh, a total of 13 times. That's because it was an essential concept for his people to understand. First fruits is mentioned throughout the Old Testament, and it's even referenced in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the term first fruit takes on a symbolic meaning. The Apostle Paul wrote to demand higher ethical and moral standards. He also used a metaphor for first fruits. He was writing to the church of Corinth, an ancient city in Greece. It's in the south central uh, part of Greece. The remains of the ancient city lie about 50 miles or 80 kilometers west of Athens. So I'm going to read 1st of Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 22. Again, that's 1st of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 20 through uh, 22. And the scripture reads, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. You see, Jesus was God's first fruits his one and only son, and the best that humanity had to offer. God gave Jesus, who was raised from the dead, up for us in the same way that we sacrifice the best we have for God. We no longer live in an agricultural society. You likely don't have to worry about harvest time or giving away the first yield of your crops, but the idea of first fruits is still relevant. It just takes on a new meaning for us. Our first fruits has moved from an agricultural based environment to a modern day harvest. That's the financial harvest. Today you sow the seeds to reap a financial harvest in your bank account. See, that's your farm. That is the farm that you manage. Now, let me tell you about uh, the difference between first fruits and tithing. Ezekiel's ministry, we're gonna talk about Ezekiel the prophet. Ezekiel's ministry was conducted in Jerusalem and Babylon in the first three decades of the sixth century. He held that each man is responsible for his own acts. As a prophet, he focused on the responsibility as it relates to the future. Be responsible for your acts today, and that, you will, and that will determine your future. Now, before the first surrender of Jerusalem, he was a functioning priest and prophet. He was among those deported to Babylonia. The town of Babylon was located along the Euphrates River in present-day Iraq. So that's how it looks on the map. So I'm going to read Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. That's Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. And the scripture reads, The first of all first fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind from all your contributions shall be for the priest. You shall also give up to the priest the first of your dough to cause a blessing to rest on your house. See, the first fruit offering are typically an annual gift to the church done at harvest time. Because we're not actually harvesting crops, the harvest can mean different things to different people. Perhaps you just got a bonus at work. Maybe you received a huge tax refund check. Maybe you saved 15% or more in car insurance by switching over to Geico. These are all harvest time moments when you, your hard work pays off. These are also great opportunities to turn back to God in gratitude for the blessings. Whenever you decide to make a first fruit offering, the important thing is that you do it freely with no guilt or obligation. This is supposed to be a celebration of all that God has done for you. It is a kind of worship that you can use to support the work of others. A first fruit offering is 
our opportunity to give above and beyond just a regular tithe. So why giving first fruits is important. Making a first fruit offering opens us up to allow God to work in our uh, life. When we approach God with open hands rather than clenched fists, it makes it easier for him to give us more to work with. Giving of our first fruits reminds us that God is our ultimate priority. It shows God that we are obedient to him and we can be trusted with more. Perhaps most importantly, being generous in this way shows that we are grateful for all God has given us. First fruits are an offering to God of the increase in income that we receive. Notice we're talking about the increase in income, not the overall amount. Specifically, first fruits is the first portion of that increase. Fruits are your blessings from God. That is your harvest. First fruits is the first portion of that harvest. What you give to God acknowledges that what you have is from God. That is why we give our first fruits. The motivation of first fruits is a free will offering that we offer out of generosity. It shows that we're not in love with our money and we are grateful to God as the ultimate source of the increase. Offering first fruits is when we receive an increase is a demonstration of our faith in God as the true source of provision. Remember, when we consider what faith is, we need to acknowledge that faith is an action word. In James, the book of James, James said that unless faith produces action, it really isn't faith at all. And in James chapter 2, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17, the scripture reads, in the same way, Faith itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So the first fruits offering is one way to activate our faith in God as our provider. Now, first fruits is giving an expression of gratitude, dedication, and trust. Again, gratitude, dedication, and trust. For gratitude, it's the acknowledgement that everything comes from God. The dedication is the declaration that this and everything that follows belongs to God. And trust, that's expressing faith in God's continued provision. So that's gratitude, dedication, and trust. So let's now talk about how to give your first fruits offering. So I bring your attention to Romans chapter 11, verse 16. Again, that's Romans chapter 11, verse 16. And the scripture reads, if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And that's in Romans eleven sixteen. 16. So what does this practically look like? How do you determine how, when, and how much you should give as a first fruit offering? This is going to look different for every person in each, in each season. The process of giving above your normal tithe can help prepare you for God to make a difference in your life. Making a first fruit offering demonstrates obedience to God rather than be having obedience to your money. First fruits are a tangible offering. It is a concept that is honorable and holy to God. That's why it's a celebration. By offering the first portion of our increase to God as a first fruits offering, we move the entire increase out of the world's cursed system and into the kingdom of God for as long as it continues. In the spiritual realm, once we make a portion, of the increased holy by offering it to God, we have in fact made the entire increase holy. Okay, so here's God's promise for the first fruits. Not only does the first fruits offering move the entire increase that we receive into the blessings of the kingdom of God and out of the world's cursed system, but it also comes with an important promise. And this is in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Again, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. And the scripture reads, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increases. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. That's in Proverbs chapter three, verse nine through 10. Obviously that promise was written in an agricultural society. I don't know about you, but I don't have any new barns or wine presses to overflow with new wine. So what do these verses, what does the scripture mean for us today? Well, centuries ago, barns were the storage areas for people to save up provision. For most of us today, the place we store up provision is in our bank accounts. So that means the first fruits offering will help ensure our bank accounts are always filled with plenty of provision. 
Isn't that something worthy to celebrate? When you think about it, those promises make sense. Our fruit, first fruits offerings demonstrate that we can be trusted with money because we don't love it. We can be trusted with money because we don't love money. We love God. Proverbs says that we are honoring God with our first fruits. Therefore, since we can be trusted to be good stewards over our finances, God could keep income flowing to us knowing it will be handled responsibly. Today, we talked about theology. That's the academic understanding of first fruits. Next week, we'll talk about divinity. That will be the spiritual understanding of first fruits. We learned about tithes and offerings and how it relates to character and integrity. Once we got that out of the way, we talked about the first fruits by giving history to it and apply the meaning with today's understanding. Now I'm going to give you a preview of the next lesson. We're going to talk about the spiritual meaning uh, of first fruits, and, which is the divinity of first fruits. I thank you for joining me. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.